Greetings folks, Rod Machado here. It seems that the FAA wants you to find your density altitude prior to takeoff and landing. So, let's say you found your density altitude using the typical density altitude chart shown here. Okay, so how do you use that number? Well, the FAA unfortunately isn't all that clear on how you should put this value to practical use. You see, the fact is that most pilots don't use the density altitude value derived from the density altitude chart for all that much nowadays. <laughs> That's right. In fact, it's rare to find any POH created after 1978 that has charts that plot density altitude to some performance value as they did prior to 1978 as shown by this chart here. It's also rare to find the term density altitude even listed in any POH nowadays. Instead, we bypass computing density altitude and go directly to the performance values associated with a specific pressure altitude and temperature as shown by this chart here. Well, isn't that a more practical way of calculating airplane performance? Yes, it's practical, but not educational, much less purposeful. So let me explain. Because we don't speak in terms of density altitude, pilots are less likely to understand what the term actually means. For instance, ask a pilot how performance changes when density altitude decreases or increases. And when you do, be prepared to see pilots act as if you've just asked them to prove Fermat's last theorem. You see, many pilots are confused by the idea that airplane performance gets better when density altitude decreases and worsens when it increases. Granted, the private and commercial knowledge exams might test this concept, but there's not one FAA exam question that asks a pilot to use a calculated density altitude to compute airplane performance. And that's a fact. That said, pilots with a grasp of the density altitude concept have a more intuitive understanding of their airplane's performance. For instance, most POHs list an airplane service ceiling, and if it doesn't, you can calculate it from the airplane's performance charts by finding the altitude at which the airplane climbs at 100 feet per minute or less. Now, despite not being labeled as such, that's a density altitude value. At the airplane's service ceiling, it's expected to climb at 100 feet per minute or less, especially if it's an older airplane and one with emphysema. Therefore, if I see an LED display at the end of the runway that indicates the density altitude is within a few thousand feet of my airplane's service ceiling, or hear the same on the ADAS or one minute weather broadcast, I won't expect my airplane to perform very well at all. Density altitude also comes into play when leaning the mixture during a climb. Many POHs recommend leaning the mixture at or above 3,000 feet for maximum RPM as shown on this performance chart. That number is also a density altitude despite not being labeled as such. Keep in mind that I can also be at 1,000 feet MSL on a hot day and easily exceed 3,000 feet density altitude. So it's reasonable to say that any altitude found in a POH that's not paired with a temperature or, and not listed otherwise is a density altitude. But most pilots might not deduce this because they are not taught to think in terms of density altitude. Now, here's where density altitude gets really interesting. Referring to this traditional takeoff distance chart, the point of intersection of the ISA International Standard Atmosphere Line with each pressure altitude occurs at the standard temperature for that altitude. In other words, the ISA line slopes left because temperature drops 2 degrees Celsius per thousand feet, which is the standard vertical lapse rate as considered by the FAA, or in this case, four degrees Celsius for each 2,000 feet drop in pressure altitude as shown on this chart. At 4,000 foot pressure altitude, the standard temperature is seven degrees Celsius. Therefore, the density altitude is also 4,000 feet. 
Moving horizontally across to the reference line to the right, if our weight is 2,940 pounds, which is what the reference line represents in this instance, then, assuming no wind, our ground roll on takeoff is 1,200 feet as shown on this takeoff distance chart. And here's what's really interesting. Returning to the left side of the chart, a pressure altitude of 8,000 feet and an outside air temperature of minus 30 degrees Celsius, which is much colder than standard for that particular altitude, produces the same ground roll on takeoff. After all, it's the same horizontal line that intersects at that first reference point. So the ground roll has to be the same. And at a pressure altitude of 2,000 feet with an outside air temperature of 31 degrees Celsius, which is really warm for that pressure altitude, also gives us the same ground roll. Why? Well, because these three pressure altitude values and their given outside air temperatures produce the same density altitude of 4,000 feet. Would you like to see some proof? Well, look at these density altitude calculations on the E6B computer. At pressure altitudes and outside air temperatures of 2,000 feet and a positive 31 degrees Celsius, and 4,000 feet at positive 7 degrees Celsius, and 8,000 feet at a negative 30 degrees Celsius, each of these values represent a 4,000 foot density altitude as shown by the density altitude marker on the E6B. So what's the point of all of this? Well, your density altitude is your airplane's performance altitude. And any combination of pressure altitude and outside air temperature that produces the same density altitude also produces the same airplane performance in terms of rate of climb, takeoff and landing, ground roll, and so on with no additional conditions added to the mix, of course. Why? Because the horsepower produced by the engine is the same for any given density altitude, no matter the combination of temperature and pressure producing that density altitude. And that is a stunning concept and one that every pilot should strive to understand. So why is this knowledge important? Because as a general rule, most smaller non-turbocharged airplanes climb less than 300 feet per minute when they are operating at 75% of their airplane's service ceiling. And since the service ceiling is a density altitude, despite the fact that it's not marked as such, you can make an immediate assessment of airplane climb performance by listening to the density altitude message on the ADAS or the one minute weather or even the uh, LED sign at the end of the runway, if one exists, not runway, but LED sign that displays your density altitude. Some airports have these. If the service ceiling in my Cessna 172 is 14,000 feet and the density altitude at my departure airport is 10,500 feet, I will certainly reconsider my takeoff decision, especially if there are obstacles in the departure path or mechanical or thermal downdrafts in the departure area. Ultimately, all pilots should know their takeoff and landing ground rolls and climb rates at density altitudes of 50% and 75% of their airplane's service ceiling. You see, knowing those values and using a well, bit of common sense allows any pilot to easily interpolate airplane performance without any other calculations. And because it's such an important point, let's remember that an airplane performs the exact same way as a general rule, at a specific density altitude, irrespective of the pressure and temperature combinations that produced that density altitude. 